Okay. Oh, All right. <laughs> Another round of blind <laughs> guardian gossip. Unfortunately, in a fairly small group today, it's the core band. And the two of you, Mark, Ronnie, welcome back. Thank you. I'm curious about your question. Yeah, so we will be more interviewers than band members. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that helps. So the start. questions will be better then. <laughs> um, this time we talk about another very important album in Blind Guardian's career, which is uh, Imaginations from the Other Side. So, um, when you started to work on that album, in which kind of mindset were you coming from the Summer Fabian tour and the whole success of the album? It was a strong euphoria, not only because of um, the first tour in Japan, but also because the album has been so successful and um, we all were really going for it and um, had the strong feeling that we could even do a better album. And we went completely freestyle. It was not that we said, well, we want to be different in comparison to Somewhere Far Beyond. We didn't say, well, we want to go this direction. We just felt the natural metal attitude would be it for us. And I do not even know if we have had a lot of inspirations around that time. Um, we started songwriting, had that fantastic uh, shelter studio rooms, and um, that helped a lot. That helped a lot. We uh, improved the studio, and I would say it was, for the first time, a real demo studio we built. And um, we were highly motivated, and when uh, we worked on the first songs, when I remember correct, it was Imaginations from the Other Side and Requiem. Um, it was going very slow from the process because um, we were even more picky with the parts we accepted for yeah. the songs. Uh, I, I remember that I never before had to throw away so many ideas because we were not satisfied. We were really looking for something... I, I mean, I really tried to bring the thing to the next level and have new ideas, um, not the typical fast stuff like we did in, in somewhere, but trying out a little bit with different rhythms, which is obvious in imaginations from the other side. Um, <clears throat> it was difficult to, to work yourself into it, because we saw, when we had the first ideas, we saw that it's good, but we didn't really know how to handle it, so we had to figure out and and play around with these elements, but once these songs were achieved, we knew we had something in our hands. Yeah. And I also remember that we had plenty of parts um, for Imaginations, which finally have not been used for this song, but ended up in And the Story Ends. So I would say a good 50% of the songwriting of And the Story Ends were parts of Imaginations. Yeah. Um, and the script for my Requiem, for example, we even finished. And when it was finished, even for the after the demo recording, we started to you know improve the song by editing parts because we felt it was a little too long, and so we took potentially good stuff out. Nowadays, I do not even know why we took it out. True. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you felt that you had something special going on. Yeah, we felt. We had something special and we um, wanted to complete a demo tape, like in the old days, that always worked for very good for us as a self-reflection, to hear what we, what we did as a recorded piece of work. And for us it was always four songs, because if you only have one or two, you cannot really say, um, yeah, that could work for a whole album, but if you have four songs, um, from our vinyl thinking, it was like half the album. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, four songs would do the trick. And um, we had this first demo tape, I'm Alive, Requiem, Imaginations, and Past and Future Secret. Past and, Future Secret. and that was a statement, these four songs. So, how come that you decided to change the producer? Was it because that you felt that the new songs were simply demanding a new, new producer or...? Mm, I, I would say it was because we were not really happy with the, how the things were going um, in the production of Tokyo Tales, uh, Tokyo... Tokyo Tales, Tokyo Tales. Tales, but also somewhere. But also somewhere. Yeah. There were too many um, um, differences. Um, we wanted to move forward. Color was strict in his old-fashioned way. And um, we, we wanted to move on. That was clear from 
93 already. And when we had the first songs, when we had this demo tape, um, Hansi and me were um, trying to find ways to, to see studios and find producers and we did a huge trip which was amazing. It was, uh, yes. How, how did we find that, that girl who did the uh, England trip I think with it us? was uh, due to our record company. It was okay. Virgin who had um, this contact and um, she was a lady from, or she is a lady from England and um, she was, you know, trying to get interested artists into the English studios. And uh, the British studios are or were by far the best. You know, they, they have had all the great equipment and, um, you know, uh, tradition. So um, we were curious to see them. But on the other hand, we had the feeling that a good producer, like for instance Fleming Rasmussen, you know, would be very essential for us. So um, we also contacted Fleming and the first trip we did to Denmark, Copenhagen. And um, Sweet Silence is a very impressive studio. Fleming Rasmussen is such a nice guy. So when we started this studio visit trip and we continued it over the summer, uh, but after we met Fleming, it was obvious. Almost, <laughs> almost clear <laughs> that our choice was done. You know? yeah. he, he was such a charismatic yeah. guy and, and very, yeah, very nice, polite. From the, the, the chemistry and funny. was there. From the very first second, there was a chemi chemistry between us. Yeah. And um, yeah, we talked all day. He showed us um, everything in the studio, the possibilities, explained what he can do for us. And um, did we play the demo tape yes. to him that day? Yeah. I think, yeah, and he was impressed by the demo tape. He, um, I remember that, I'm not sure if he said it that day or when we started with the um, actual production, but he said, when I listened to your demo tape, I thought, wow, that, that's so great. What can I do better? <laughs> and um, so, yeah, we, we really kept the songs like they were. And the chemistry was great. And Denmark is, a, especially in summer, a very nice city. And oh, we yeah. enjoyed the atmosphere yeah. totally. With a haven, with a little <laughs> yeah. haven. Yeah. There. Yeah. We went yeah. out and we had a great time. So at, uh, at the evening, we went uh, direction England, London, met that lady. And um, we, you know, we were trying to betray ourselves that there still would be an option for any British studio, but it was impossible. You know, the deal was sealed the day we met Fleming, um, and we liked his work with Metallica and Pretty Mates. Yeah. It, it is amazing work, and he did a lot of good stuff afterwards. And we figured how talented he is, so um, it was obvious that he would be the right choice. Uh, but the trip to England, uh, to the studios, it was, was cool. so I don't want to miss it. And um, oh. Fiona, the lady who was accompanying us, was such a very nice person. It was yeah, amazing. We met time. so many great people and saw really impressive studios. Some were even more impressive than, than uh, the Sweet Silence studio was. But as Andre said, and as I said, it was obvious that he would be and Sweet Silence would be the right place for us to do the album. Yeah, I mean, we saw studios where Beatles and Rolling Stones recorded. What, what else do you want? <laughs> it was so amazing to see these uh, historical places. So, but uh, this was the first production you did outside Germany, so you had to ship or get all your equipment there. How did you do that? And other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we had a van. We, we, we rented a van, a seven and a half ton truck, and we put all the equipment in, but behind the equipment, the first thing we loaded in was booze. <laughs> we were Lots covering it by all the because equipment. Because all we know was that you know, booze in, in Scandinavia would be very expensive. Yeah. And we were typical metal guys in the 90s, of the 90s, so it was essential for us to have as many beer with us as possible, red wine, whiskey, vodka, you know, everyone had a different taste, but we, we covered it all. It all. <laughs> and I, I mean, I think we, we brought as much alcohol than equipment. It was like 50-50, yeah. the yeah. truck was like 50-50. Yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> it was heavy loaded and uh, I cannot recall, did you join uh, the van or was it, I think was I, it I, me I, and Tom? No, I think I was driving the van. And I, I just recall, you know, I, I have not been to Sweet Silence before, so I had no really, not really an idea what to expect or where it would be in Copenhagen. And we were arriving in the middle of the night, one o'clock in the morning or something like that. We got to the studio and it, it looked like the end of the world, you know, yeah. it was just like 
a house on the corner of some street in not very spectacular no it looked like nothing and you know i expected okay that's going to be the studio where master of puppets was recorded i expected something spectacular and you know ah stop here i was like where <laughs> <laughs> here i was like what do we do here <laughs> that's the studio <laughs> it's like okay <laughs> but once you entered the 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 actual studio complex it it got obvious yeah. where we've been but I have no idea how we crossed customs, to be honest. <laughs> I, I don't remember being checked. I think we just we went on the yeah, ferry, we just crossed, the night. and it that was, was the it. Middle of the night. Nobody checked it. But I think someone controlled the passports at the very no, least. No, that was in Germany, Denmark. No, I don't think so. No. In the nineties? Really? Yeah. I don't remember. And, uh, for sure, as far as I remember, I was driving the truck, and the, the, the equipment was for sure not checked. Yeah. But we were smart enough to load the alcohol first, yeah, first and then, and then, then the gear. So. <laughs> <laughs> we did good. It was gone after one night. No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it, it has taken maybe six weeks, eight yeah. weeks, and it was a lot. Yeah. And we also went out. So. <laughs> <laughs> but eventually you actually started recording also. Yeah. A little delayed. <laughs> and uh, I read under it that Working with uh, with Fleming was quite the difference working with Kalle because he was so much more demanding on your guitar playing. Yes, absolutely true. I r remember, <coughs> I mean, we were already for a long time in the studio because drum recordings took a while and I was already comfortable with the whole situation. I, feel that I felt at home and then it was my part to play um, a rhythm guitar. I think it was. I thought um, um, it was another holy war. I chose to start, and I thought, okay, that's an easy one. Speed metal. We do this since years. No problem. And it's really fast. And Fleming looked at me. I was playing, and I thought I was done. <laughs> <laughs> And he looked at me and he asked me, like, are you still warming up? Can we go? <laughs> <laughs> well, was it the same situation for, for you as well? That, uh, yes. he, was <laughs> <laughs> he was compared ab about his, his focus on being tight and being precise. It was a whole different world compared to Kalle. And that's not meaning to say anything bad about Kalle. It's just praising Fleming because he was so focused on this. And it definitely took the whole band on a completely different level. In any aspect, mm. I never learn from or by the mistakes of others. Others, um, I did the same thing. I started with another holy war because that was considered to be a peanut song. Yeah. In comparison to a lot of the other stuff, and yeah. that was completely wrong because it was so fast and it needed to be precise. And I'm, you know, not praising you, but I'm even even slower than you are. So or I was. <laughs> Um, and it, it didn't work in the beginning. It, it took a while, you know, we should have learned that lesson by what Tom experienced, but we did not. And um, in my case, it was not a long period, maybe two or three days, but um, they were, you know, tough. I remember him sitting um, in his chair and it always appeared as he wasn't listening because he was playing computer games like yeah. Backgammon or Min something. Mini golf. <laughs> Mini golf. <laughs> you were like, okay, I'm yeah. paying this guy, you know, for playing. But he was so on spot, you know, while, you know, playing and listening to the music. It was nothing for him. And he immediately realized mistakes. Yeah. Uh, uh, but again. <laughs> 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 <I'll clear. laughs> um, after a while, um, when when I was doing my vocal recordings, he didn't even talk. You know, he just said, "Well, listen to it. You want to do it again?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you started the production in August, but you had to stop in November because you had a damaged nerve, which was uh, causing you a lot of trouble. Um, how were your thoughts during this period? Were you ever afraid that? this could be it, that you couldn't play guitar anymore? Yes, I had that fear. Um, I remember that I was um, in the recordings of Requiem. Um, I played some lead guitars and um, all of a sudden 
I felt that my little finger and this one was getting um, numb. top numb and um, I said hmm I have a numb feeling in the fingers maybe we should do a break and we did a break and after one or two hours it was still the same and I said hmm it feels uncomfortable to play I feel like I, I cannot really control them a hundred percent and I flew home uh, to see a doctor and the doctor did a test uh, with um, electric impulse something and um, he found out that my nerve was between the bones here um, since my birth unfortunately and um, it was from doing certain movements it was in soccer <laughs> and especially playing soccer yeah uh, table soccer yeah it was so injured that it was almost through and he said if you would only wait one two more days longer it would be through and then you can never use that hand again because we could not fix it you need an operation immediately and so okay that guy was a professor and he could arrange that I would have a, um, surgery the next day and I said okay I will do it I, I don't want to lose my hand that's my my job my future everything and um, so I went to the hospital immediately um, took the surgery and um, then we had to my I couldn't move my arm after that I still have a scar here and um, yeah so uh, we had to wait I think three months um, before I could start to do certain uh, things with the fingers again and try to re rehabilitate them and uh, so we had to do this break in, in the middle of the production and everybody was suffering it, it was a big problem I had the fear all these three months if my fingers would come back or not if this was the end or not of course that is that is troubling your mind all the time I was really down and the mood of the whole band I think was not so good at that time because we never ever before had to break a production or such a terrible thing.